welcome to Hot Issues. And today, Hot Issues is coming to you from the Kofi Annan International Peace Keeping Center at Teshi. And we're going to talk, be talking about West Africa. We're going to be talking about the role of the United Nations in ensuring democracy. And we're going to be talking about many things. And we have a very, very, very special guest. Welcome to Hot Issues. <laughs> Welcome to Hot Issues, and Hot Issues is coming to you from the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center at Teshi. And today we're going to be talking about West Africa. We're going to be talking about the various elections in West Africa. The Nigerian election has already taken place. We are expecting the Togolese elections to take place on the 25th of this month. And we're going to be talking generally about democracy and respect for fundamental human rights throughout West Africa. And we are very, very privileged to have with us our own Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas. As you do know, Dr. Chambas has been many things. Uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ghana, he's been working in that force, special representative of the UN Secretary General. He's currently head of the UN Office for West Africa. He's a special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations Organization. Dr. Chambers, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you. Thank you, Gwesi. Yes. It's always a pleasure. What brings you back to your own country? What are you doing in Ghana? Uh, actually, I have been invited this time uh, by the Kofi Annan uh, International Peacekeeping Training Center. They have an annual Dark Hammarskjöld Kofi Annan Lecture Series. And this year, I've been privileged to be asked to deliver the lecture and of course uh, any opportunity to come home is always a uh, pleasure uh, but especially also to come back to this center which has become one of the centers of excellence on the continent for training you know, peacekeeping uh, personnel uh, so really I'm very happy that I was given this opportunity to deliver the lecture and also to be back home, giving me the opportunity to interact with so many uh, people that I hadn't seen in a while, while I've been here at the uh, Kofi Annan Center. What are you discussing in these lectures? The theme was challenges of peace and security in Africa, a West African perspective. Uh, so what I did was to set out the general challenges we face on the continent, uh, with a West African particularity. Um, <coughs> as you said in your introductory remarks, uh, as far as the challenges of peace and security in West Africa are concerned, for this year, we are focused very much on the elections that are scheduled in five, six countries. All of them, uh, in a way, special because the last time around, in practically all these countries, the, the elections previous time were challenged uh, or contested. In Nigeria, that was certainly the case. In Togo, to be followed by Guinea, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, and now additionally in Burkina Faso. These will be elections at the end of the transition. So it's important that those elections succeed to indicate a successful transition in Burkina Faso. So that's certainly priority number one. But the issue of Boko Haram in Nigeria is also a major preoccupation for the United Nations this year. Secretary General has said it severally when he's been asked about priority issues uh, demanding his attention. He's always named among them Boko Haram uh, terrorism in northeast of Nigeria, but which is now posing a security challenge to the neighboring countries. Uh, the Sahel and the continuing problems uh, some will say fallout from the Libyan crisis uh, and the situation in Libya now and thereby creating this floodgate of uh, arms circulating in the Sahel with the attendant crisis that we've seen there, certainly in Mali, but also posing significant challenges to Niger uh, as far as to, to Chad. Um, some of the new challenges now are the issue of piracy 
-hmm. in Western and Central Africa with the discovery of oil along the Gulf of Guinea. We've seen increased activity by pirates engaged in bunkering, oil bunkering, hijacking of vessels. So we need now to take into account in our security strategies maritime security to ensure that uh, oil facilities offshore are adequately protected. Um, migration, transborder crime, these are some of the issues that I, I, I discussed in my presentation. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned Boko Haram as one of the challenges of our democratic experiment in West Africa. Boko Haram has recently pledged allegiance mm. or, or announced an alliance with ISIS. Mm. Doesn't that make that a bigger problem than a West African problem? It certainly is. Uh, I must say that initially there may have been a tendency to look at Boko Haram as a localized issue in the northeast of Nigeria. Perhaps even Nigerian authorities may have been guilty of that. Uh, but I think more and more we are all beginning to see that no, Boko Haram is part of an international network of terrorist organizations and they themselves by their own admission have uh, pledged uh, uh, allegiance to ISIS. Uh, but beyond that we also see that indeed in their activities uh, they have not just focalized on northeast of Nigeria, the three states of Adamawa, Yobe, and Borno. They have now more and more crossed in to Cameroon, posing a serious security challenge to, uh, to Cameroon. In Niger, in Difa province, you know, they have been active there and also across Lake Chad into, into Chad itself. So they certainly have this uh, regional mode of operation which makes Boko Haram not a Nigerian issue, a regional issue, and by their international network with international terrorist organizations, frankly, an international issue. And that's why the UN has been working very closely with all these countries, the countries of the Lake Chad Basin uh, Commission, uh, to tackle Boko Haram, and particularly not just the military aspect of it, but the consequences of Boko Haram activities in that part of uh, West and Central Africa. What is the solution or what should be the response to the, the threat posed by such organizations as Boko Haram? Mm. Is that a military problem? There's clearly a military dimension when you have groups like that well armed, um, sometimes beyond the scope of what local armies uh, possess, and we've seen that with Boko Haram, that uh, the initial confrontations between Boko Haram and Nigerian police, initially it was just a law and order issue, but they completely outgunned Nigerian police force. And then even when the army was initially deployed, uh, thinking that this was just a bunch of ragtag uh, extremists, they found that these were people who were having rocket propelled grenades and sometimes even anti-aircraft, uh, uh, very heavy equipment, uh, of course, which we, we all know and can trace to the arms that uh, were uh, let loose from the armories of uh, uh, Libya. Uh, so they're so well armed that there's certainly that military dimension to it. Um, to, to, to especially the hardcore, some of them very well trained also. Uh, they need to be dealt with decisively. However, beyond that, and when we pose questions of why are young people, sometimes well educated, attracted to groups such as that, those begin to raise uh, broader issues, perhaps of marginalization and neglect and underdevelopment and lack of job opportunity. And, and, and which then requires a broader than a military, a single military approach. In other words, military plus, 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 plus. Let's look at the humanitarian uh, crisis immediately caused, villages that have been displaced, homes destroyed, uh, but then go beyond that to uh, look at some of these factors of how do we bring development to these areas in a, in a sustainable way that people can look up and have hope in successful livelihood activities in these zones. 
It has been suggested that uh, it is time for governments and indeed international organizations such as yours to engage in dialogue with such groups. What is your attitude? Well, I think um, on this, we work very closely with the countries affected. The UN approach is to accompany the countries that are in this. Sometimes they know best the approach to handle this. Of course, one must make a distinction between hardcore criminal element, terrorist element, part of international terrorist network, and several others who probably join by bandwagon effect. Mm -hmm. That distinction has to be very clear, and the approach is not to target whole communities and just label them as Boko Haram sympathizers and engage in activities that will, in fact, otherwise drive the communities away from legitimate security forces. And that's why the UN has insisted that even in combating groups like Boko Haram, human rights concerns must be at the core of this. The military and other security forces must do it in such a way that they do not force or push the communities to begin to have sympathy for the extremist group because of the harshness with which they have been handled. So there has to be a combination of some political means, uh, diplomatic means, uh, but certainly a, a direct military approach to hardcore elements who may uh, probably just be unrepentant. How did you see the elections? Is it true that these elections were particularly well organized? Yes, the I think... The element of fairness and so on. Yeah, there's no question. I think um, uh, what I have also said before is that um, President Jonathan deserves credit because from the beginning, that is even uh, when he was uh, acting uh, president or you know, when he took over from President Yaradua, he pledged that his ambition was going to be, or one of his major uh, objectives was going to be to deliver credible, peaceful elections in Nigeria. No question that before 2011, many of the elections in Nigeria were, to put it mildly, highly questionable. And the first time that Nigeria held elections that most observers went away feeling, ah, okay, this comes close to a credible election, was in 2011. And uh, obviously he didn't stop at that, you know, promised again that this time also the same would happen. And we saw improvements in technology. I would say perhaps uh, learning from some of the experiences of Ghana, where you know we tried to introduce technology to eliminate double voting and you know uh, voter improving on voter identification using technology. So all of that was 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 done. And um, but one thing that uh, in terms of the improvement. Uh, is that they learned from the Ghana experience because when we had opportunity to talk to Professor Jega and say, well, this thing that you're about to do, are you aware that there were some problems associated with it in the Ghana elections? He admitted and said, well, you know what? We sent people to Ghana and they were there for weeks and months to understudy what the problems uh, were uh, and then, based on that, we made some improvement. I'll give one example. In Ghana, the machine that was to do the verification, what we call a verification, mm -hmm. was basically to capture thumbprints. And uh, once that failed, it became a problem. So what they did to improve on the system was they had a machine that captured all ten fingers. So if your thumbprints could not be captured, one of your ten fingers could be captured and identified. Mm -hmm. Second, they build a picture, the person's, the voter's picture, into it. So if they couldn't get your thumbprint, as you stood there, your picture would come up. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, so there were these kinds of things which showed that they had in that indeed done some homework, learned some good lessons and good practices from neighbors, and I think this all enhanced the transparency and the credibility of the process. And that's why I think we've seen relatively 
lower levels of violence with the Nigerian elections. And uh, many of us are proud that Nigeria is going able to do this because as a leader on our continent, uh, we've always insisted that Nigeria has to lead by example. And it was becoming embarrassing that in, in the conduct of elections, although they have the capacity, certainly have the human capacity, they have the resources, it was always a challenge to deliver credible elections. But there were problems nonetheless. And what may some of those problems be? Um, some of those problems were logistical for the most part. Um, as has come to be associated with many African elections, and I think it's a factor of underdevelopment. Our road systems are not that good, our transportation you know, network. So delivery of equipment to so many polling stations within a short time mm -hmm. has been a challenge. Uh, in Ghana, I mean, to just mobilize and deliver all this equipment to 20,000 polling stations within, and they ha have to be there within a certain, has been a challenge. And that's why you often see in, one, in some stations, polling doesn't start till 10, 11, when it's supposed to start, say, at 7. Mm -hmm. The same challenges were there in Nigeria, that equipment <coughs> and uh, other material were not at polling stations on time. And so uh, it was delayed. And, and what fascinated most observers, and I remember the head of the EU delegation, who is Spanish, telling me, he said, you know, I always thought Nigerians were more impatient than Spanish, mm -hmm. but coming to observe these elections, I've seen that Nigerians are more patient than Spanish because mm -hmm. he was admitting that in Spain it would have been hard to contain and ask people to wait in line, which they patiently did in Nigeria until everything was set up and sometimes as late as 10, 11 o'clock, and then the process uh, started. Hello and welcome back to Health Issues. And we are in conversation with Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas, a former president of ECOWAS and now special representative of the United Nations Secretary General and indeed head of the UN Office for West Africa. From Nigeria, it's, it's obvious that uh, Togo is going to have his elections on the 25th mm. of this month. How does Togo look like? You know, in Togo, there are two <coughs> issues. Uh, the two can be kept apart, although in Togo, some politicians always mix them. There's first of all, the technical issue of conducting elections, ensuring that they are transparent, credible, that the systems are in place to create a level playing field. As far as that is concerned, the UN and partners there's a group of partners in Togo called the GSENC, the G5, uh, comprising the UN, the EU, uh, US, France, and Germany. These are partners that provide material support for Togolese elections. Uh, and the, the work starts with the UN fielding what is called a needs assessment mission. This was done in Togo last year. And out of this needs assessment mission, it is determined where are the weak points, where, what are the challenges associated with conducting this election, how can the international community, working with ECOWAS, with the AU and all, assist a country to bring its standard you know, to par with internationally accepted uh, practice. This was done in Togo, and out of the recommendations, sufficient funds were mobilized, and we have worked with Togo to assure that all the players agree that the conditions are ripe for conducting credible elections. Uh, as I know, towards the end, there was only one issue that came up. That is the electoral list that uh, may have been overbloated by a certain number. And so, as you may know, um, the opposition raised this with the chairman of ECOWAS, president of Ghana, uh, President Mahama, who then, based on consultations, agreed that they postponed the election. And to bring in a neutral, neutral uh, player to help with cleaning out this electoral list. It's, it's, uh, it's electronic base. 
So the organization of Francophonie, OEF, International Organization of La Francophonie, were then approached and they brought in experts who have sort of cleaned out the, the document. The problem is this, you're never going to have 100% <laughs> you know, list, which is yeah, because we're in Africa and uh, you know, our statistical base is very weak. And so those challenges are there. But what is important is the acceptability by the parties mm -hmm. and the candidates participating in the process. So we are at the point in Togo now where all of them agree there are no issues in contention regarding the strict conduct of the elections. So we should expect on Saturday, the 25th of April, that uh, fairly credible, transparent, free and fair elections will be held. The other issue in Togo is what in Togolese context they call constitutional reform. This has been an ongoing debate. And it's actually, it's over two issues. One, having term limitation in the constitution, as we do in Ghana and in uh, most other Af West African countries. Because in Togo now, there's no te term limitation. So the, op the opposition have been agitating for a number of years now to have term limitation. The second issue is two, in other words, that uh, the winner from a presidential election must have 50 percent plus one. You know, so, and if that's not the case, you have a second round as we have again in Ghana. Um, in Togo, it's first past the post. That means the one who gets the majority at the end of first round is uh, elected president. But these issues, strictly speaking, have nothing to do mm -hmm. with the conduct of elections where, as I have said, uh, a, a lot has been done to improve on the system. Mind you, the Electoral Commission in, 20, uh, only in, uh, in 2011 conducted uh, legislative elections in Togo, which were accepted by all the parties and is the basis now of the composition of uh, parties in the Togolish parliament. Uh, since 2011, working with the UN and other partners, it has even improved uh, over uh, the systems and processes that it had in place. And that's why uh, we should expect uh, fairly credible elections on Saturday. Why is the international community so very interested in African elections? Is there something peculiar about African elections? Yes, what has been peculiar, and this from a historical perspective, has been that one, just a plain refusal to have elections in the past have heated up political systems and led to uh, leaders hanging on to power way out of term with whatever constitutional dispensation was there. And these were sources of uh, political uh, conflicts and subsequent crises in countries. Secondly, badly conducted elections, botched elections, have also in the past been a trigger for conflict. So when we talk about early warning mechanisms and putting in place uh, uh, frameworks and structures to prevent conflict, and more and more in Africa, we want to be in the mode of preventing rather than wait till the crisis breaks out and then we're running all over the place to mobilize troops to be very expensive when, once the conflict has already broken out. And that's why it is important to accompany these processes, pay attention to them, and work with countries so that more and more elections don't become the kind of contentious, uh, you know, uh, make or break kind of uh, contest that they are. And uh, I think that if we can work with countries to ensure fairly acceptable, peaceful, transparent elections, then we would have saved uh, a situation which could have triggered a conflict with wider consequences be beyond the country involved. Because you know in Africa we're also linked. So conflict breaks out in one country, the impact is felt across the region. But why is the international community not also interested in elections in places like North America? 
where they've had very contentious issues. Yeah, that, that is true. The reason there is that they have much more mature institutions. Uh, they have societies and a rate of development where, to be frank with you, for most people in the country, they can even ignore the elections and still have a livelihood. I lived in, in Brussels where after election one year, for about 18 months there was no government. And you would hardly have noticed that there was no government in Belgium. You know, function normally everything was, you know, because very few people, frankly, depend on, on the Belgian government for their main source of livelihood. They have a developed, you know, uh, economy, very diversified economy, and uh, people can. Uh, in Africa, as you know, we're still at that level where the state and government, as such, is so much uh, implicated in, in the economy, in people's livelihood, that, as we often say, the stakes are very high when it comes to elections. And we still have also situations of uh, uh, win and lose. Uh, and those who win, <laughs> win all. Those who lose, lose everything. So all of that go to pump up the whole atmosphere around elections because it means if you win, you're okay the next, you know, at least till the next mm -hmm. cycle of elections. If you lose, you are out. And so these are some of the things going forward. How do we make this uh, political systems that we are developing more based on uh, situations where, you know, party can win 40 percent of the votes and yet, you know, it's, it's nothing at stake. I mean, not, then it's nothing, in, you have to wait till four years. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to have coalition politics and uh, carry people along. And one way of doing that, frankly, would be through decentralization. You know, effective decentralization can lead to a situation where if a party loses nationally, as for instance in Nigeria, uh, PDP has lost nationally, but it's still controlling at least 12, 13 states out of 36 states. So it doesn't feel that it's a total, uh, mm -hmm. and, and incidentally, some of those states are the wealthier states in Nigeria. So systems of decentralization can help to, I think, uh, attenuate the level of tension associated with elections. So there's not a winner-take-all, uh, zero-sum game, but a system in which uh, people can feel relaxed even if they lose nationally, they know, okay, perhaps they still have some role to play at lower levels uh, of state governance. What about uh, introducing the system of proportional representation? Yes, which has worked in, in other places. Uh, yes, I think uh, some of the European systems are based on that. I think a classic case is Germany. Today, for instance, uh, the German government uh, is, uh, constituted by the two major parties in Germany. Um, of course, a lot of that also comes from constitutional practices that uh, these countries have evolved. Um, so um, I would not uh, at this point just make a categorical statement to say which is better. What I believe though is that one way we can diminish tensions around elections on the continent is move away from zero-sum uh, kind of politics. What the precise formula should be obviously should come out of broad national discussions and constitutional processes which take into account a desire mm -hmm. to, to balance you know, political forces uh, and to carry as many people along as possible and to reduce uh, potential uh, conflict uh, points in the system. How is Guinea looking like? Guinea is one of the uh, countries where we expect to have perhaps a little more difficulty uh, with regard to the forthcoming elections. The elections are due in October. As we speak now already, tensions are high. Indeed, as we speak now, people are on the streets demonstrating. They started last week. They postponed them. They, they, uh, they, they, they continued them from yesterday. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, the UN is 
very much preoccupied about that Guinean situation. I have myself uh, been asked by Secretary General to go there in the next day or two and to help to set up a national framework for dialogue. This is what we, we want Guineans to understand, that uh, Guinea is a very a country with a history. This is a country with very proud people and proud traditions. But it's about time that they also uh, just really put the permanent and constant conflict uh, behind them and move on with their democratic process. But to do that, they themselves must develop Guinean uh, structures for inter-Guinean dialogue. It shouldn't always be, I, mean, I remember from the time I was in ECOWAS, to go there and then, you know, with AU, uh, with UN. But Guinea has to build its capacity, its own capacity, for engaging in dialogue across political divide and arriving at consensus on some issues and then moving forward. And this is what we'll seek to do. But uh, the Guinean situation is especially worrying uh, because of the fight against Ebola. Uh, the three countries uh, which are most affected being Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Of these three, Guinea is, I'm afraid, at this point, lagging behind. Liberia, as you know, we've reached zero case. The numbers in Sierra Leone have since January consistently come down. The capacities have been increased in Sierra Leone in terms of beds, for isolation, in terms of laboratories, in, in terms of uh, communal watch for burials, teams for burials, all of this. In Guinea, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, it goes up, it comes up. Mm -hmm. You see, so it's kind of plateaued at a certain level, which is not comfortable enough. And then to go into a, a situation of political crisis with demonstrations in the streets and crowds, that will not behove well for the uh, fight uh, against Ebola. And we were very worried. And this is why I think uh, the UN working very closely with ECOWAS and the AU and other partners will do all we can to, to, to encourage dialogue among Guineans towards uh, calming the situation and agreeing on the political framework for moving forward. What are the contentious issues in, in, in Guinea? The what, what are the main issues? The issue now from the opposition point of view is that in 2013 there was an agreement that after the legislative elections which were held then, local level elections will be held and then the presidential elections. Um, this, the Independent National Electoral Commission in Guinea has announced presidential elections for this year and local elections for next year. The opposition claims that this is not consistent with the agreements that were made, and uh, they're insisting that they should have local level elections before uh, presidential elections. Uh, it has to do with who is in charge at the local levels. So they believe that under the current system where the president who appoints all, mm -hmm. you know, prefer and super like um, local authorities. Um, even in areas where the opposition control, they are appointed by the president, the opposition f believes that they, they, they will be, there cannot be credible elections if there are no, uh, uh, if the president is in that position where he has appointed all these people. And so they want the local elections first before the presidential elections. Of course, the government's response is that, first, we don't have money. The Ebola uh, virus disease has caused us tremendous economic mm -hmm. dislocation, which is true. And we've, we've, uh, the government resources have dwindled, and we're not in a position to finance two elections this year. Secondly, with Ebola, still a, a huge challenge in Guinea, it will be unwise to conduct two elections because elections by their nature means campaigning, gathering of crowds, you know, so these are the issues really at stake um, in, in Guinea at this point. Welcome back to Hot Issues. We are in conversation with Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas and we are looking at the West African situation 
with special reference to all the elections that have come up and are coming up, you know, this year. And before we went on break, I raised the issue of Burkina Faso. Right. Burkina Faso is in a period of transition. Right. How do we see this transition going? No, Burkina Faso has been a very interesting case because this is a country where we've had a president who was there uh, for 27 years. And um, on the one hand, was a very important peacemaker on, uh, in, certainly within our West Africa region. Uh, but at the same time, where the civil society uh, had grown to the point where it was mobilized to resist any attempt to amend the Constitution to elongate the term of the president. And when uh, push came to shove, we saw that civil society prevailed. There was an insurrection. And uh, President Kampari, who is otherwise perceived as one of the strong leaders of uh, West Africa, um, was pushed out of office and all of this uh, very, very quickly. Now, the rapid intervention of the international community, you remember there that the ECOWAS, the AU, and the UN moved in very speedily, one, to avoid a deterioration of that situation, and second, to arrest any situation where there might have been a confrontation among the security elements of the country. Uh, this we now consider as a good example of early intervention, uh, and then what we see now is the civilian t transition which has been put in place. Um, the civilian transition has a good chance of succeeding, one, because the head of it, Michel Cafando, is a very experienced uh, man. He was in retirement, having served as foreign minister and his country's minister. Uh, I mean, his country's ambassador to the UN, he has one thing in mind, a short transition. I don't want to exceed by one day the limit that has been given for the transition, which is a good beginning point. Because usually the problem starts when you have a head of a transition who mm. begins then to want to... Mm. He understands also that he is not and cannot be a candidate, you know, to succeed himself. So that's very good. Secondly, you still have... Uh, political forces, particularly the civil society, political parties, traditional and religious leaders, all mobilize in support of the transition and to ensure that it succeeds and doesn't exceed its limit. Uh, thirdly, we have a fairly competent electoral commission, I must say. It should be emphasized that before the overthrow of President Campari, there were really no issues in contention regarding the work of the Electoral Commission. So it's not, we didn't have to create one and begin from scratch. So that's also very helpful. And then in addition to all of that, you have international community united and speaking with one voice in support of this transition. Uh, so I think combination of all of this speaks in favor of a fairly successful transition in Burkina which is not to say that there are no challenges. As with any transition, it has its challenges. Of course, uh, one of them is the role of what is called the, the RSP, the Special Presidential Regiment, which is a security force established by the former president for his protection, mm -hmm. and which over time <laughs> outgrew the entire army put together. It's a force of just uh, a little more than a 1,000, but they have more arms, they have this really special, mm -hmm. um, even more than the rest of the army. How to incorporate that into the regular armed forces of Burkina is one of the challenges that they have to deal with. It may not be feasible just in a transition period, but going forward, there has obviously to be some security sector reform to address this particular issue because the uh, next elected civilian government not feel that it needs uh, a special military force mm -hmm. to protect it from what? Not the people that elected mm -hmm. uh, him. And certainly would want maybe the protection of president to become a normal police function, you know, uh, or at least some other uh, arrangement. Uh, the other issue now in contention 
is the extent of inclusivity going forward to the elections. The international community and many others have advocated for an inclusive process. What we now see emerging in Burkina is that some of, the, of those who were involved in the insurrection are saying, but our, our fight could not have been in vain. So we believe that we need to identify certain individuals who have been responsible for putting our country in this transitional state in which it is, and to say that at least for the next elections, they too cannot participate mm -hmm. in the electoral process. Mm -hmm. This is a debate going on in Burkina Faso, and we have to watch and see how that will play out. Mm. Now, there's also the case of La Côte d'Ivoire. Yes. What are the main issues in the La Côte d'Ivoire elections? In Côte d'Ivoire elections, what we see now is that, of course, there's the issue of the preparations for the elections. Uh, initially, there had been some real difficulties in the composition of the Electoral Commission because the opposition parties felt that they were not adequately represented in there. Uh, through negotiations and dialogue, that has been addressed, and I think more uh, seats have been offered to the opposition, including the position of a vice chair of the Electoral Commission. Um, Côte d'Ivoire is not a, a poor country, and so we don't expect that there will be difficulties with funding for the elections. The other challenge, but that strictly has, uh, is not to do with the process of elections, is the state of play within the political parties. There's clearly some turmoil, f first within the ranks of the uh, PDCA, which is the second uh, major party in coalition with the government, where some prominent personalities such as Amaraisi, former foreign minister, former AU secretary general, and Konam uh, Bani, former governor, former prime minister, have disassociated themselves from uh, the party because they do not agree that the party should from be... From the alliance. From the alliance, yeah. exactly. That's the issue. Within the FPA, which is the party of former president Babu, there's also a division because there are... Uh, some uh, uh, forces within the party who would like the president to be maintained as the leader of the party and consequently is presidential candidate. Now, they are in contention with uh, Mr. Afi Nguessa, uh, Afi who is a former prime minister and the acting president of the party who has argued that no, they need to move on. It may be uh, impossible to have President Gbagbo as candidate, and so he is uh, presenting himself as a candidate. This has caused a division. So that's the political dynamic in Cote d'Ivoire. But strictly speaking, as far as the conduct of the elections are concerned, this is a country with a lot of capacity, just like with Nigeria, both human and financial, and we frankly don't expect too much difficulty or even request to in the international community for assistance in conducting those elections. What about the element of fairness? I mean, all mm. those mm. who fought on the side of President Gbagbo, mm. many of them have been arrested, mm. they have been indicted. Mm. Madame Gbagbo has been convicted, mm. actually. Mm. But those who fought on the side of uh, Alassane Ouattara mm. are free. Yeah. Doesn't that raise a substantial issue of fairness? It raises an issue of a deficit in the national reconciliation process. And that has been admitted um, uh, by many observers in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, they have a term which is uh, justice de la vainqueur, justice of the victor. You know, and um, this perception is undermining the process of national reconciliation. Uh, some will even go to the level of the ICC and argue that in the indictments that have been made so far, the problem should have been more balanced in recognizing that uh, atrocities were committed on all sides and therefore if there are going to be indictments, that there will be indictments of persons on both sides of uh, the divide at the time of the post uh, election violence. Uh, so clearly there's a lot of work to be done in Cote d'Ivoire 
in the area of national reconciliation, how to sew back the, the societal and social fabric and make Ivorians feel like one people, uh, not uh, you know, people divided by who's on the side of the government, who was on the side of, of Babo. Um, sure, uh, one is not uh, arguing against uh, or for impunity. In fact, those who committed grave errors, uh, violations of human rights, need to be punished. But uh, it should be in a manner that is seen to be across board and uh, not uh, partial, uh, which is the, the perception of many people. One other issue which has gained a lot of attention, and it's not about West Africa, mm -hmm. is indeed the, the, the xenophobic attacks in South Africa, affecting several citizens in West Africa, likely to lead to a refugee crisis and so on. Mm -hmm. Are you following what is happening in South Africa? What as an African, thoughts? yes. As an African, yes. Although, obviously, I have no responsibility over South Africa. But um, as an African, it worries me a lot. Uh, it's a shameful act. What is going on there uh, must be an embarrassment, a huge embarrassment to the government of, of South Africa. And it's our, most of us, you know, who uh, want to see this continent advance. This is not the kind of thing we expect from South Africa. Uh, South Africa is one of our natural leaders on the continent, and as I said earlier with regard to Nigeria, we want to see leadership by example, and here it has totally failed. Uh, we are in an era when we're talking about integration, and this is a country led by no other party than the ANC. The ANC should be in the forefront, should be in the vanguard of the African integration project. What is happening is totally at variance with this. Uh, the threat to South Africa cannot come from the puny little African community there. And I think uh, it's about time that there's a very serious reflection by our brothers and sisters and our comrades in South Africa to, to, to really think deeply about what is plaguing their country and to address it in a very determined way that we don't see a repeat of this. Because it's uh, frankly shameful. It's been suggested that what is happening in South Africa is perhaps a reflection of the fact that apartheid has not been defeated completely. Well, I, I don't, I mean, there are many reasons to be advanced for this, including, of course, youth uh, restlessness, youth unemployment, uh, but whatever the reasons are, cannot justify the scenes that uh, have been shown us on, you know, television pictures and, and other means of, I mean, it's just horrendous, you know, to take innocent uh, uh, people who are working to earn a living for their families, who most of the people being attacked are people who have created jobs. They have not taken jobs from it. These are young entrepreneurs, small-scale business people who out of nothing. It would be interesting to follow the history of many of these people. Have come out of Somalia or Mozambique with nothing. And by dint of their hard work have created opportunities and in fact are employing South Africans. These are not people who should be targeted and uh, given the kind of treatments that we are seeing. No African deserves that treatment. And we just hope that um, the South African authorities will rise up to their responsibilities and bring a quick end to this and ensure that in future we don't see a recurrence of this. Because this is not, uh, unfortunately, this is not the first time. Hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for, for, for talking to us. Thank you.